Okay, I'll be discussing one-way functions imply secure computation in a quantum world, uh, which is joint work with Andrea, Dakshita, and Fermi. Okay, so this talk is about uh, secure multi-party computation, uh, which I will now define. Um, uh, we consider uh, multiple parties, each with a private input Xi, uh, that wish to compute some public circuit C over their private inputs. Okay, and so they'll do this by communicating and eventually all learning the output. And for security, we want to um, ensure that an adversary that corrupts any subset of these parties, so here parties two and three, won't learn anything about the honest party inputs x1, x4, except for what it learns uh, from the output of the functionality. Okay, and this is a um, a classic problem in in crypto, going back to uh, dating back to the 80s. Okay, so yeah, to give a little bit of background on on what's known about MPC in, in a classical world, in which you know all parties are classical, the functionalities are classical, uh, we'll really have to look at the simple primitive of OT. Right, which is um, a two-party functionality um, between sender and receiver. Um, and what's known is, uh, is that actually uh, OT, a protocol for OT implies a protocol for um, multi-party computation of uh, general functionalities, arbitrary functionalities among arbitrary number of parties. Okay, so if, if you're interested in obtaining feasibility results about MPC, um, you, know, you can really focus in on this very simple functionality of OT. And indeed, uh, you know, there's been, been many works that studied OT, and it's known from various uh, standard cryptographic assumptions, such as uh, Diffie-Hellman style assumptions, learning with errors, etc. However, a major goal in, in cryptography is to base uh, your primitives or your constructions on as uh, weak or as simple uh, as assumptions as possible. And one-way functions, the existence of one-way functions is kind of the weakest possible assumption that's currently known to apply, apply crypto, right? Um, it's a very generic assumption, just saying that uh, some, some one-way function exists, right? Unfortunately, in, in 89, in Paul Glass and Rudit showed that you provably cannot construct OT um, from black box usage of one-way functions, uh, thus showing like a black box separation between these. And even to this day, some 30 years later, th there are no really non-black box techniques uh, known. Um, so you know, current state of affairs is that it's not known um, and there are barriers to constructing OT from one-way functions, okay? So you could also ask about, um, you know, what happens in a quantum world when, you know, parties and adversaries are quantum and they have potentially quantum inputs. Uh, so it is still true that OT implies MPC and, in, and indeed it even implies uh, multi-party quantum computation as shown by these uh, works of DNS and DGJMS. Um, but quite interestingly, um, Kripa and Killian in 88 uh, showed a template uh, for, potent for constructing um, OT uh, based on bit commitments. They kind of just gave this template, okay? Uh, which, is, which is interesting because such a template uh, is not known in the classical setting, right? And what really differentiates uh, their protocol is that it makes inherent usage of quantum communication during the protocol, okay? So um, like, you know, it wasn't until like many years later that, that DFLSS actually like instantiated this template uh, from a concrete assumption. In particular, they, they built a particular type of bit commitment from LWE uh, that then allowed to prove uh, the security of this OT protocol following this uh, CK88 approach, okay? However, still there's nothing, you know, it's, the end result is not new, right? Because uh, it was already known that LWE implied OT, which implies MPC. Um, another interesting work, however, BF10 showed that following this template, you could actually obtain some weak form of OT, um, which is like indistinguishability based OT as opposed to simulation based OT, uh, just from one way functions. Okay. And so this is super interesting and not known in the classical setting. However, uh, this weak, like in based OT, is not known to imply a full fledged MPC. Okay. So there's still this gap, right? Uh, at least prior to our work, it was not known whether one-way functions were sufficient for, uh, you know, full-fledged MPC. And so kind of to recap what I have, have just said, and, you know, in the classical world, we have this uh, separation, this black box separation between, between OT and one-way functions. In a quantum world, it, uh, you know, the relationship was, is a little bit less clear. And so, so our work uh, shows that actually, uh, you know, simulation secure OT that is sufficient for MPC can be built even from just black box usage of, of one-way functions. Um, and again, this result is in a quantum world and uses quantum communication. Uh, but this establishes you know, that uh, you can actually build full-fledged MPC 
uh, for one-way functions um, in a quantum. Okay, so so this is the result, um, and I you know before getting in tech into techniques, I'm going to have to share some uh, background about how this Kirpan Killian uh, OT protocol works. Okay, so here we have you know we have our sender with two strings, a receiver with a bit b. At the end of the protocol, we want the receiver to output s sub b. Okay, but not learn anything about s one minus b. Right. So the protocol begins. Uh, you know, I guess. Uh, similar to like a key exchange, a quantum key exchange protocol, and that one party uh, sends a bunch of so-called BB84 states over, over to the other party. So the sender samples random BB84 states, which is which are basically uh, consists of uh, sampling two bits per per, per state, um, uh, one bit uh, determining what basis uh, the state is going to be in, the other bit determining you know uh, which of the two possibilities uh, the state is in. So. Um, you know, you have uh, the head of our basis uh, plus and minus and the standard base is zero and one, okay? And, you, and the sender just basically sends, um, uh, yeah, random BB84 states to the receiver, okay? So the receiver at this point doesn't know what these states are. Uh, what it's gonna do is sample its own random sequence of bases and, and, and measure uh, these uh, qubits um, in its own uh, basis data frame, okay? And so uh, roughly half the time, it'll guess the right basis, roughly half the time, it'll guess the wrong basis. And so in the positions where it guessed wrong, this x prime it, it obtains are just going to be uniformly random bits. But in the positions that it guessed right, it will obtain the correct, um, um, or it, you know, it, the values it get will match uh, the values that the sender sampled. So basically, this is kind of establishing some channel where the sender is sending some classical information in the form of, of quantum states. And the receiver is obtaining um, some random like subset of this information. Okay, so it's so some of this information essentially gets erased by the measurements that the receiver is performing. Okay, and you know the sender doesn't know well, what the receiver got uh, correctly and what it got incorrectly. So it's kind of this eraser channel is is happening here. So um, you know uh, we can obtain an OT protocol eventually from this um, by by next having the sender, you know, announce like, okay, these are actually the bases that my qubits are in, which, which gives the receiver the information about which uh, parts of the string X prime were correct and which were, which were random. Okay, so the receiver is then going to partition the indices into these two sets, one in which it was correct and one in which it was incorrect and send over this uh, partition back to the sender. Okay. Um, you know, and so what this, you know, the sender then partitions X uh, according to these indices. And so what this is really setting up is a situation where the receiver knows exactly X B, um, but doesn't know anything about X one minus B. And so the sender can then encrypt their, you know, their zero string under X zero and their, their one string under X one, okay? Um, right, so this, this gives like a correct uh, protocol and uh, seems pretty secure if the receiver is like you know exactly following this this, uh, this template, right? But there's a very easy attack that a receiving a cheating uh, receiver can mount, which is just to simply wait until the sender announces the bases uh, to measure, right? So you know imagine the the receiver just doesn't measure these qubits, and then it eventually gets the sender's bases. Now it can measure all of these qubits in the correct basis, and learn um, you know the entire uh, correct string x which allows it to break security, right? So in order to fix this, uh, you know, the idea um, uh, from Kripal Killian was to insert um, this measurement check sub protocol, which is basically there to, um, for the sender um, to check that the receiver is honestly measuring the qubits that it sent in the first round, right? So what we're going to do now is after the receiver measures, they're actually gonna send uh, commitments. So these, these locked boxes represent cryptographic commitments uh, to all of their uh, basis choices and uh, measurement results, okay? And then the sender will ask uh, the receiver to open some random subset of them, uh, which it will do. And the sender will, will make sure that like, like all of the um, positions where the receiver guessed the basis right then it must have obtained the correct uh, bit. So on this, you know, on this fourth position, the receiver guessed right. Therefore, it must have um, obtained the the bit zero. And if the receiver is, you know, correctly, you know, 
correctly obtaining all of the all of the bits, uh, then the sender can be reasonably convinced that the receiver was, you know, honestly performing these measurements. Okay, so this kind of like this kind of uh, uh, so then they're going to have to discard some, the qubits that they use to to test, and then they uh, proceed it with the rest of with the rest of the protocol on the on the um, non-tested qubits, right? And again, this is called this measurement checksum protocol. Okay. So, so right. This is kind of the, the idea that was put forth by Kripal and Killian. Um, and as I mentioned, it was not until a while later at DFLSS that kind of uh, security, at least simulation security of this OT protocol, was formally analyzed. And what they showed um, in this paper is that if your uh, bit commitment scheme satisfies certain special properties, then you can indeed prove that this protocol is simulation secure. In particular, if your commitment scheme is extractable, then you can obtain security against a malicious receiver. If your commitment scheme is equivocal, you can obtain security against a malicious sender. Um, and so to see like intuitively why that is, um, let's say you want security against a malicious receiver. Um, and in particular, what that means is that the simulator is going to have to interact with this receiver and extract their effective choice bit B, right? And so what the simulator is going to do is, you know, first extract from the receiver's commitments, which they can do assuming the commitment is extractable. And, you know, now that they know all of, you know, theta prime x prime, when the receiver sends over uh, the indices i0, i1, they know exactly which one which ones the receiver guessed right, which ones the receiver guessed wrong, and which exactly indicates uh, what the receiver's choice bit was. Okay, so this is how how to perform extraction, um, right? So uh, on the other hand, if we want security against a malicious sender, uh, it's the same deal. We're going to have to at least extract the sender's effective inputs from it, which you know are s zero and s one. So uh, the strategy that the simulator is going to uh, perform to do this is to basically carry out the receive malicious receiver's attack I mentioned earlier, which was basically to delay measurement of these qubits. And the simulator is going to be able to do this because we require these commitments to be equivocal, right? So what's going to happen is the simulator interacting with a malicious sender is not going to measure initially. It's first going to send some dummy commitments, um, equivocal commitments. And then once it receives the, you know, the challenge from the sender, it will then only measure uh, the qubits that it has to, so two and four in this case. So it can pass this check. Um, and then later when the malicious sender sends over uh, like their bases, now, now the simulator can measure um, all the rest of the qubits and learn all the information about X, um, allowing it to you know, learn both of these um, um, X0 and X1 and eventually learn both uh, S0 and S1. Right, so we saw that you know, if this commitment is extractable, then you can ex extract the receiver's input. If this commitment is equivocal, you can extract the sender's input, and this can be leveraged to obtain uh, full simulation security of this protocol. Okay, so this was what was you know shown by DFLSS, um, and this is also the starting point of our work. Um, so. Our goal now, if we actually want uh, the result um, OT from one-way functions, is to build an extractable and equivocal bit commitment from one-way functions, right? And so this is what, uh, what we do. And we basically have two technical contributions in order to, to do this. Uh, uh, one of them is uh, a, a black box equivocality compiler, which basically takes any, like, any commitment scheme and turns it equivocal. Um, in a black box manner, okay, um, and also in a post quantum manner, right? All of this has to be post quantum. Um, and the second thing is just is taking any extractable or any equivocal commitment um, along with quantum communication and, and making it an extractable commitment, okay? So, you know, we have these two ingredients, um, and in order to eventually obtain an extractable and equivocal commitment from them, we proceed in three steps. So basically start with a, a, um, a regular commitment with no extra properties that's known from one-way functions. So for example, Nauer's commitment. Um, apply our equivocality compiler to that to turn it equivocal. Apply our, you know, our second step here to turn that equivocal commitment into an extractable commitment. Um, but now it's no longer equivocal, so we actually have to apply our first step again to um, 
kind of in a black box way make this extractable commitment equivocal. Um, and this preserves the extractability. And, and in the end, we get uh, what we wanted, which is an extractable and equivocal bit commitment. So yeah, let me now say a, a few words about each of these steps. I'll actually start with the second one because it's, uh, it's a little bit more um, immediate based on what I've already discussed. And in fact, it uses this like CK template, it, which is a template for OT and turns it into basically in a template for an extractable commit. Okay, so what I mean is that, you know, let's look at this OT protocol that I just had on a couple of slides ago and recall that uh, if this, what I argued was that if this commitment is equivocal, then there existed a simulator that could extract the sender's inputs from the sender, SDRS1. So we're gonna take the same strategy in order to uh, you know, come up with an, equi with an extractable commitment, right? So let's view this sender no longer as being like an OT sender, but actually a committer that would like to commit to a bit B, okay? So we're gonna do the same, very similar protocol, except um, that you know, this committer no longer has two strings, it just has a single string that it's going to encrypt with X, okay? Or really a single bit B that it's going to encrypt with X. And in order um, to extract this bit B, we can equivocate these receiver commitments and extract in the same manner as I, as I described um, in the OT protocol, okay? So this gives this kind of like second result is that, you know, again, this is crucially using quantum communication, right? So if we have quantum communication and we have an equivocal bit commitment, we can obtain like this post-quantum extractable commitment, okay? Right, so this is, uh, this the second step, and now I can uh, talk about this first step, which is this black box equivocality compiler. So again, we're taking any commitment scheme, com, and turning it into an equivocal commitment scheme, equip com. Okay, and this proceeds as follows. So, in order to uh, equivocally commit to a bit b, we're going to have the committer first send four uh, commitments. Okay, so it's going to sample two bits and like. Uh, commit to each bit twice, okay? And the receiver is wants to be convinced basically that the committer was acting honestly um, by committing to like, like wants to know that the committer is really committing to the same bit in each of these, in each of these rows, right? So it's gonna check this by sampling a random bit C and for the purpose of the slide, we'll assume C is equal to zero and asking the committer to open to like the zeroth row, okay? So, the committer will indeed give openings to this to this row. The receiver will check that indeed they both uh, commit to the same bit, okay? And then uh, the committer will also uh, hide the bit that it wants to commit to by XORing it with, with U1, which is the bit committed in the other row, okay? So, yeah. So now how is the committer going to open? Um, well, it'll simply give one of the commitment keys for you know, one of these two uh, bottom commitments, right? And then the receiver can obtain U1 and strip U1 off of this bit to obtain uh, the bit B committed to by the committer, okay? Right, so um, yeah, so why is this equivocal first? Well, um, so what can a like, you know, equivocator do is it can basically cheat in how it uh, forms uh, these four commitments. Um, so in particular, can choose one of the two rows to lie in and basically commit to different bits, okay? But of course, for this committer to not be caught, uh, we need the receiver's challenge to be, uh, you know, a particular bit. Like in this case, we're going to need the receiver's challenge to be zero in order to ensure that this equivocal uh, committer is not caught, right? And so uh, what you can do as, as a simulator, right, is, is basically rewind the receiver until you get the challenge that you want, which in this case is, is zero. And then, yeah, the, the equivocal uh, committer can like open, the receiver will be happy and, and they can just send like a random bit in place of uh, a bit, the bit they want to commit to. And so this is equivocal because now in the open phase, this committer can either open uh, this first commitment or the second commitment. And depending on which one they open uh, determines like which bit they're actually opening. So it's not even until this open phase that the committer really has to decide which bit to open to. Okay. so. Right, so if, if, we're, if we're simulating uh, a receiver and we have the ability to rewind them, then basically we're, we're able to equivocate this commitment. Um, and 
again, we're in the post-quantum setting where rewinding is not necessarily uh, straightforward and in fact runs into many issues in many settings. Although we show that in this setting, uh, we can actually use Watrous's rewinding lemma um, to successfully rewind and simulate a, a receiver. And also in the paper, right, to establish, um, you know, binding of this uh, a protocol against, uh, against a committer. Um, we're gonna have to like basically repeat this whole phase like uh, multiple times. And, and so I will um, uh, let you look at the paper uh, for those details. But this is kind of the basic idea of how we, um, you know, from any, uh, from any commitment scheme, note that we didn't use any like special properties of this commitment scheme and we use it in a black box manner, we can construct an equivocal commitment from it. And so this kind of completes the technical um, contributions of our paper. Um, before ending, I did want to mention that there is a, um, a concurrent and independent work, uh, GLLSV, that was at uh, Eurocrypt this year, um, that also have, has the same uh, core result that one-way functions and quantum communication implies it to. Okay, I'll just mention a couple of differences. Um, so the, I guess the main advantage of our of our work is that we actually use the one-way functions in a black box way, which establishes like um, a clear separation between the classical and quantum um, settings, and could be useful, you know, for you know maybe we obtain um, you know commitments, commitment schemes from like various other assumptions, perhaps, and you could just plug those into our our black box compilers and 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 get the protocol to work. Whereas GLSV like use the one-way functions in a non-black box way, okay. Um, but they also, uh, you know, they also study uh, the um, OT and the CRS model and give a cost around protocol. Um, and then a couple other differences is actually our protocol has one-sided uh, statistical security. So we get, you know, we get computational security against malicious sender, statistical security against malicious receiver. Whereas GLSV is both sides computational. Although one of their building blocks, uh, they show how to obtain a statistically binding extractable commitment, um, you know, with quantum communication, and this is um, not something that we use as a, or that we construct as a building block. So, yeah, I just wanted to say there's this uh, um, concurrent work with the same um, uh, main result and and a few differences along the way. So, um, and yeah, that's it. So so thank you. <laughs>